Uh, back to the question list. Uh, Andre Jasper had a question earlier. Andre, are you still there? And do you want to ask your question yeah. now? Yeah, this is for Neil Griffiths, right? We should get mm -hmm. back to the questions for Neil. Yeah, uh, just is is a question, but it's also I like to make uh, to make a point for the paleo wildfires we had here during the Gondwana, uh, uh, during the Permian, uh, because we probably uh, had Myers burning. It means that uh, lots of carbon dioxide was uh, put into the atmosphere. Uh, so, uh, and if uh, you had the same uh, in the late Pennsylvanian, uh, and also the Myers were burning, and so it, it could be one explanation for this uh, high uh, uh, paleo uh, carbon dioxide uh, concentrations you, you, you find sometimes there. Oh, absolutely. I, I actually always was uh, a bit curious. Um, in, I, I actually read a lot of your work when it was putting together the stratigraphy down there. And um, yeah, <laughs> I think I, I definitely think something's going on climatically as well to be getting these fires showing up uh, in the sort of the Rio Benito formation. Um, and yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the contribution to PCO2, that's something I think that uh, should be investigated. I, I'm not, that's, that's probably more of a Isabel or John Ritchie question. Uh, they, they, that's sort of their expertise, but I, I, I agree with you. York Schneider, did, did you, I'll get to you in a second, John, and York Schneider, with, uh, you had a question for Neil? No, <clears throat> Neil, you have shown a linkage between these large igneous provinces uh, of Europe to deglaciation. What is the link? So, so at least for the, um, the latest Carboniferous, it seems like the Rotligan Volcanics that we've dated, and there, what I showed was only a couple ages, but there's actually many more that uh, are being dated and have been dated. Uh, and it appears that the Rotligan volcanics, you know, are, are synchronous with the deglaciation of Namibia, with those black shales in Namibia. And actually, after those, after that volcanism, there's no more subglacial evidence in Namibia anymore. So. I think something's going on sort of to ice thresholds. Like we, we lose ice in Namibia and we never get subglacial evidence again there after that sort of volcanism. And now that, that seems to be synchronous with the glacial record. That's, that was sort of my observations from uh, the uranium lead data between those two basins or between because them. Of, because of exhalations from I the think, I'm assuming CO2 release from the volcanics. And those Rotligans also intrude, uh, there's lower uh, carbon rich units in Germany at that time period in the, below those Rotligans, and I guess in the Vettine formation, um, there are uh, not black shales, but organic rich shales and things like that as well, from my understanding. Uh, interesting, 20 years ago, I met uh, in a brainstorming of German research foundation uh, I made a proposal to, to look for links between those volcanism around 300 million and climate development. <laughs> they call it the crazy idea of Schneider. <laughs> they give no money for it. Yeah. No. Uh, 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 just at present, um, a new mega criteria has been de uh, discovered in, in Germany, which could be in size which is possibly larger than Yellowstone. Wow. Yeah. Excuse okay, me, Bill. I will, send, I will send you some papers about, new papers about volcanism and, and, yeah. and age data. Uh, thank you. Yeah, this is, this was, and I have to point out that this is work that I've been working on with Roland Mundell, who is, um, he, he, this is sort of, we, He's been working on this sort of tangentially for a while um, on dating some of the granites that are there as well. And um, I think our work in Gondwana is sort of what 
you know, we kind of got that um, thought process going again about what's driving these short, abrupt deglaciation events. And to me, the most parsimonious interpretation would be some sort of short-term PCO2 release, which the volcanics seem to be uh, temporally correlative. Excuse me, Bill DeMichael? Yes, Phil. Yeah, I can't get my video on. Okay, well, I'll call on you in turn and you can speak without your video, that's okay. You're, you're down the list, two more people. So oh, okay. let's hang in there. John Isbell? Yeah, Neil, I, I think you've done a great job of bringing us uh, forward in terms of some of the age dates and stuff. And I really enjoyed your presentation. You. And you and I both go round and round on drivers. <laughs> uh, do you see local drivers as being important at all? And why I ask that is in Western Australia, you have disappearance of uh, the glacial deposits, but yet you haven't changed paleo latitude that much. And glaciation continues. Actually, it continues in Bolivia in the Teresia Basin until at least the Muscovian, long after it disappears in Argentina. And then when glaciation disappears in the Paraná, and then in, uh, in Namibia, and it continues in Southern Africa, you haven't changed paleo latitudes. Why aren't there glaciers there when things are going on in South Africa? So and things I, are going on in Eastern Australia in the mid latitudes. <laughs> I, so, I, I, so I think you're absolutely, there are local drivers, I mean, as, Eric and you have shown in Argentina that tectonics has to be considered in, in these records as well. And I think that's particularly important in, in the Eastern Australian record, as well as in Western Argentina. I think the nice thing about this sort of the Paraná or the, essentially the central Gondwanan record is it's, these are intergratonic basins and are largely um, not really influenced by any active tectonics at this time period. Uh, there is sort of to the southern part of South Africa, there is sort of the establishment of the Cape Fold Belt, but that the, the, the White Hill and those rocks were all deposited first. So, I mean, that has to have occurred after the deposition of the White Hill in terms of the, the uplift of those regions, in, in, my, in, my, in my thought, based on the, the stratigraphy there. Um, so... There is absolutely local drivers, I mean, in, in these regions, but I think in terms of what's driving the final demise of ice, I think, you know, there is, there does seem to be that continental arc collisions in the, in the low latitudes it does seem to correlate fairly well um, with the, uh, with the long term ice record, but there has to be something that's driving these short term perturbations uh, that we see in Namibia and Brazil. Um, and then we also understand in the in the eustatic record that's above uh, the glaciogenic evidence in the Parana to be driving uh, that. And and for us, I think one explanation could be the volcanics of the Rotligans or or other volcanic provinces that aren't known yet either. But there's there has to be a short term push. That's, yeah, that's I'm also curious on just uh, what paleo mag reconstructions you're using for your your plate reconstructions. So for I, I use Domir and Torsvik, which I think you know for these reconstructions, um, for you know, they're a little bit less ambiguous for um, Gondwana and proper, right? So for the south eastern South America and and Africa, I think. You know, when when we get into where our, where uh, Antarctica or Patagonia were, that's that's a bit of a contentious story as well. But I think for um, Brazil and South Africa and Namibia, I think those reconstructions are fairly well uh, and consistent between different uh, uh, different studies between the plates model, let's say, or the the uh, yeah, the, the plates model has it moving from 300 million to 280. It has a has huge jumps in terms of the position of the pole. So it does vary, but both are consistent and it never goes to Australia. It goes out into the Panthalassan margin. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Neil. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thanks. Next, uh, um, we go to Lynn Sorgan. I would interject something here, though. One of my favorite quotes about the geological record is from Harry Hess. 
uh, Scott Elric put me onto this, and he said that if it did happen, it can happen. And so I think we're faced with a lot of those kind of things in the <clears throat> geological record. I mean, here it is, it happened. So now we have to explain it. So there it is. <laughs> and, Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Neil. Interesting talk, and I had a couple of questions. One was, I think, and correct me if I misheard here, by the way, I also wanna apologize for coming on and creating noise, which you very um, uh, gracefully <laughs> fixed. Oh, no. I've been trying to, I don't, I don't know if anybody else is doing this, but there's a, there is a um, virtual workshop on geological climate change happening right now as well. So I've been kind of dueling with my Zooms anyway. Um, you mentioned coals and that your interpretation is, is low stands. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. So, yeah, that's a good question. So the coals in the Parana basin, um, they're actually in these fluvial sandstones, which are sitting on top of, uh, uh deglacial rocks or, or on top of, um, these sort of flooding surfaces. So in my interpretation that you, you essentially go from, uh, glacial continental to glacial marine, and then into uh, fluvial deposition. So in order to get back into the fluvial deposits, I, you, you have, in my thought, you, you have to drop base level to, to go there. And the coals are sitting in those sandstones that are sitting on top of the, uh, the um, glacial marine rocks. So that's, that's, that's what led me to that interpretation. Got it. Okay. And then one other question, and this goes back to sort of the, uh, the um, issue about, you know, I think that Spencer had mentioned tectonic complications in the Permian Basin and, you know, the whole thing about glacier used to see, tectono used to see, you know, hypsography, all these things. So if we look at what's happening today, um, and, and we have to think about timescales too, because responses, response times are different and so forth. But, um, you know, Hudson Bay is, is undergoing a regression, right? And it will continue to undergo a regression. Um, any high latitude sites will because, because of the, you know, rebound as the, and the gravitational difference as you remove the ice. So, um, so there's a, at a minimum, there's a time lag between, and the initial response really should be regression followed by transgression. So how, do you, how does that factor into your thinking and especially your correlations between the equator and high latitudes? So that's, that's an excellent question. And so I, I think, you know, as you know, noted too, I think it's really a time scale problem. And in terms of, you know, if we're looking at 10 or 20,000 years, it'll appear as a regression. But as we look at, you know, it, one of the things that I think in correlating with the low latitudes, one of the things I, I want to actually look for are these sort of major glacial deglacial events right like can we see flooding in the in the wolf camp and and you know based on the um the time constraints that do exist for the permian basin that you know it's very sort of coarse resolution based on the continents and things like that um but it does appear that the wolf camp and the cisco and canyon formation that that boundary is an unconformity and essentially a base level drop that they trace out on the shelves and that is roughly synchronous with ice buildup in high latitudes at 298. So I think that would be a target um, for providing some age control. And then also there's the uh, Wolf Camp B is roughly a general transgression event or deeper, essentially a deeper water facies from my understanding. Um, and that is the time of that, of that based on the continents is roughly around 284, 285 in May, which is synchronous with the loss of ice in Gondwana. So I think the, just going after specific time events, just to test, is this model working or not? Now, I mean, there's absolutely a tectonic component as well, but I think if we're looking at millions of years time scales, uh, well, sorry, if, if the more parsimonious interpretation is if, from my view, at a million year time scale, if you have a deglaciation and you lose ice in Gondwana, that that should appear as a flooding surface in the low latitudes, right? Or as a deepening event in, the, in these basins. And, and that's not saying that tectonics isn't acting at all as well. It's just that I think um, the, the glacial eustatic signal is still there. I guess that's, was that a, did I butcher that answer? <laughs> so, so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's complicated. Yeah. It's complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank Bill you. Heckle? Yeah. <clears throat> Several comments. First, uh, Ron Martino brought up uh, Merrill and uh, Wilkinson's article about that cyclothems didn't exist. Well, I read that carefully when it came out. I was going to write a rebuttal, but uh, uh, everything else piled up, so I never did. But they had grouped a couple of things that we would expect to be cyclic, like pileosol or uh, underclays and coals, because they all said, oh, that's the same thing. <clears throat> so instead of calling that a cyclic change, which would have been, you know, everywhere, they uh, made it, they, they grouped it together. So there was one less cycle. So it, it had that kind of a problem to it and uh, nobody picked up on it. I, I did, but I didn't uh, write a rebuttal. And then when we talk about the Moscow uh, basin, it's really a shelf like the Northern Midcontinent shelf and we can line up those cyclothems amazingly well with a certain amount of uh, a really good biotic, uh, or I should say fossil uh, correlations, not everything. I mean, there's uh, endemism in both places, but uh, the fact is you can line them up and they're, and they're all separate. Each cyclothem is separated by a disconformity and paleosols in both places. And therefore they're roughly a similar height of shelf above wherever the sea goes with respect to whatever the geoid looked like at the time. So we know they were roughly the same position on the shelf for the sea level rises of that time. And then uh, 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 talking about glaciation uh, with John Isbell, um, the, uh, I think my diagram showed a way to look at glaciation versus interglacials. And maybe these small cycles that uh, that, uh, um, oh gosh, I forget his name now, my, my age, uh, the fellow who talked about the glaciation in the Southern Hemisphere, um, maybe some of those cycles, small cycles they see in, in the Namibian Basin are reflective of the cyclothems that fill the interglacials in my diagram. In other words, they're small glacial cycles at a time when there wasn't much glaciation, but they sure had an effect on those shelves, like the Northern Midcontinent Shelf and the Moscow so-called basin, which is a shelf. And then the last comment I'll make with respect to glaciation versus uh, uh, the pan-tropical cyclothems, we need good radiometric dates in both places and a lot of them, and then we can line them up. Agreed. I, yeah. <laughs> I have a question for um, Sophia Makarowicz, if she, she's around, today, including and, and Neil for you and, and, and Lena, you guys have dealt with, with modeling. You know, we can fall in love with our own ideas and so I sort of have, and I want to get it dashed, you know, uh, smashed up so I can forget this idea. But Scott Elric, the Illinois survey, and I were once sitting around and, and Scott had dug up some literature on what happens when peat beds are flooded with marine water. And when they're flooded with marine water, they release an enormous amount of methane. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's literature on this. It's, of course, it's all on relatively small scale peat beds. But when you have peat bodies mm -hmm. the size of, let's say, the Colchester number two coal that runs evidently from Kansas all the way into, into Pennsylvania, and you flood that progressively, you, even if the, you're, you're released, you wouldn't release it all at once. But as a, as a transgression proceeds, you would be flooding more and more and more of that peat body and driving it, creating, and then releasing more and more and more methane. And methane is a super greenhouse gas. Could, could that have anything to do, could be a positive feedback loop that once the ice starts to melt, it really, it really could be accelerated on these giant tropical peat bodies? Uh, I'll let Sophia answer that if she wants. I think that, I mean, that's, an, that's a really interesting comment. Um, you know, in, in, at least in the Parana Basin, I, there are there also are coals there as well that um, do show evidence of some sort of. There there are pyrites in some of the coal deposits, right? Which so suggests that you must have seawater come in uh, at least at, at some time. Now, relative to the, uh, they're not in. That, I should say it's only in the uppermost coal in the, that we date in the Fashionale where we see that, but um. 
yeah, that's, I mean, that's something that should be considered, I think, at least. I, I don't know as much about this for the low latitudes, though. So maybe. Well, there, there are models that show peat uh, as a transgressive systems uh, response to rising sea level. And my answer to that always is if rising sea level causes, causes coal to form, causes peat bodies to form, then they should be all over Western Pangaea, mm -hmm. and they're not. And if they should be all over the continental shelves of every continent around today, and they're not because yeah. rising sea levels has been going on for 10,000 years, more or less. And, and show me an example. Show me a Pennsylvanian type peat body anywhere on earth today, low ash, high carbon content, 14, 15 feet thick, uh, which would be what, three, three, three to 10 meters thick um, that's being caused by rising sea level. I mean, yeah. the answer is you can't. And so it, it, everything's driven by rainfall. So the, and these peak bodies, when we look at them, Pennsylvanian peak bodies, the only place you see absolutely unquestionable marine influence, like marine invertebrates in the peat and things like that, is at the top. Yeah. So, so they're flooded late in, in as, as something changes. They may be on the transgressive systems tract, but they're, that's because it depends where you measure transgression from. Yeah. You know, yeah. Center of the earth or whether you measure it from the edge of the shelf. So they may be forming during the initial phases of transgression, but they're not being driven by rising water table due to pollutification of the coastlines. So that, that's, that's, that's just wrong. And, uh, and it's, so I, I agree with what, where Ron Martino put them. I remember he, he and I have talked extensively about this. I think that they are in late glacial to early transgression, but they're still not being caused by the, that rising sea level. No. It can be caused by climate. Yeah, and getting at the whole idea of, of the CO2 release from meth or, or methane release from the flooding of those coals, that's, I mean, that's, an, a, that's something that I think could also, uh, should also be investigated in, in reference to the CO2 record, so. John Nelson, you lit your uh, screen up. Do you have something to say? Were you gonna make a comment? Uh, no questions at the moment. Oh, okay. I thought you'd turn your screen on to make, make a comment. Yeah. Ron? Yeah. Um, and I think I talked to John Isabel about this at a meeting a while back, quite a while back. Um, you know, it seems like people try and correlate ice volume and loss of ice volume with, with the sea level record. And my understanding is that 50% of the rise or fall in sea level is not due to the addition or subtraction of water. It's actually due to the change in the temperature and the expansion and contraction of the water mass that goes with that. And so I think you could certainly have sea level changes, uh, even in the absence of significant ice that, that could be related to these, to these temperature cycles that just aren't allowing, maybe because of orographic effects or something else, uh, large amounts of ice to develop. And so, you know, the, the idea that just the temperature change of the water mass itself could cause it to rise and fall because of expansion and contraction, I think is something that often gets lost in this discussion about glacial used to see. That's a, that's a very interesting point. Any, any comments about that from the modeler folks? John? Uh, no, I agree. I, I've actually tried on numerous occasions to track down how much sea level change there would be, and it's it's not an easy thing to do, even uh, for the Pleistocene. I, I can find 20 different references that tell you different amounts, but certainly there would be thermal expansion and contraction. It's just a question of, of how much. Uh, but I, I think that comes into play, this concept of uh, aquifer used to see. Uh, and uh, I think all of it's really a climate record, uh, however you look at it. And I know I've been accused of not believing in, in uh, cyclothems and glacial used to see, but that's, that's not entirely true. I've, I've told Phil, I actually wanted to be a grad student uh, of his and Ohio State uh, accepted me uh, sooner than Iowa did and I accepted there. <laughs> or I would be uh, one of Phil's students. <laughs> But no, I, I think they're all important and all come into play. And, and I think we need to focus on more than just glacial used to see, but maybe, maybe climate used to see. Yes. We're, all, we're 
all Phil's students, I think, if, at least I, if, I think in, in a blank way, Phil, I'm your student too, and in the field with you. And it's like, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, I saw an interesting talk on the Cretaceous one time where they were attempting to explain what looked like cyclothems in the Cretaceous. And it was there, and they could find no evidence isotopically of ice. And the explanation was entirely uh, temperature driving water on and off uh, terrestrial aquifers. It was a really interesting talk. I don't know if it ever got published or by two, uh, two German uh, researchers. Um, I thought it was pretty, you know, so it, it, there are all these other dimensions to consider. Do we have other things to discuss that anybody wants to bring up um, before we close? Matt, you just turn on your screen. I just had a real quick question for you, Bill. Um, you'd mentioned uh, the, the seawater coming in and releasing a lot of methane when it uh, basically inundates uh, peat bogs. Does it have to be seawater? Um, all of the coal beds that we have at, at Joggins and Maritimes Basin are interpreted, and emphasis on interpreted, as being freshwater, maybe brackish. But they're all overlain by, by a thick organic rich limestone with the spirobids, with pyrotized fossils occasionally, uh, which is why I suspect maybe there might be some marine incursion in there, but all of the biota are fresh water, apparently. So does it have to be uh, marine or could it be fresh or brackish as well? And is there any information out there as to what sort of effect that might have on, on methane uh, release? I, I, I did a little poking around in the literature on this. There are some publications on Canadian, Western Canadian peat uh, bodies and what happens when they're flooded. And I, I believe that there's, you still get methane release if you flood, completely flood a peat body. Um, that's, what, that's what causes floating peat islands um, is that they fill with methane, they tear off and then they float up um, and then they'll, they'll sink back down again. But then often they'll float back up again if, uh, until you exhaust the methane. Um, I don't know, all I know about it is from the literature. I've got no uh, first-hand knowledge, but if you, there are, there are a number of papers out there on, on methane release from flooded peat bodies. Very cool. Spencer, you want to come on and uh, you and I can do the swan song. Say goodbye. I think we're at the end guys, unless there are more questions. I think we've come to the, the end. Great meeting. meeting everybody. Yeah. It's yeah. Really the meeting is only as good as its participants. And I would say we've had a series of remarkable talks. I appreciate all the work that everybody put into the talks. It reflects a lot of uh, research, some quite new, some reviewed, et cetera. And of course the questions, the discussion has been good. And this is a group of people who are not looking for simple answers. So you guys, you guys need to stay away from those mass extinctions because that's where the easy answers are. This is, this is a very interesting time period. It's kind of like today, isn't it? Isn't it like looking, I mean, you know, you have the analogy with the ice ages and, and there's a lot of complexity in the modern world that I think we can see in this Casimovian world or we can try to tease out. Yeah, I, I would echo Spencer's thoughts and, and thank everybody. This has really been great. You've all, the talks were uniformly outstanding. Um, a lot of work went into them. A lot of thought has gone into the discussion. Um, it's, we have recorded most of the talks. We will uh, eventually figure out what to do with those recordings and, and make them available to you. And we will keep the Dropbox with the, um, um, papers in it open for several weeks. Again, if you want to download papers in there, please copy them and then move them to your uh, folders. Please don't just take them out of the Dropbox or they'll disappear uh, for everybody. So if you, if you need to get a copy of them, just you know, make a copy and then copy it out to your own computer. But we'll leave that up. I will remove the Dropbox where people were putting their talks. So when you loaded your, that was basically for us to get. So I'll, I'll remove that Dropbox, but the others will be intact. If you can't find the one with the um, PDFs in it for some reason, I'll see if I can arrange some other way to make them available to you. And please keep putting them in there. Yeah, probably what'll happen is the, the thinking is the Smithsonian will put the recorded talks up on one of its YouTube channels. And if that's the case, they'll have to be edited a little, et cetera we'll send you all a link 
hopefully in a few weeks. So you'll have access to the talks. I've had some colleagues who couldn't attend the meeting asking me about this and that that will give a, a record of some of this. Um, just the ones, there were a few people who didn't want their talks recorded and they of course will not be up there. But um, yeah. yeah, and all the literature is there. Keep adding to it if you want and don't just add your own papers. I put the GSL volume we're doing on the Carboniferous timescale, there are 10, 10 of about 15 chapters are done. They've been published online by GSL. They're behind GSL's paywall, so they're not easy to get to. You have to have access to what's called the Lyell collection. I put all 10 of them up in the Dropbox folder, which is fair. They're not, it's not really a public website in my mind. And so feel free to download those. That's Hounslow on magnetics, uh, Vachard on forams, uh, me and Stimson on the footprints, go, and uh, uh, Barrick. There's a big article by Barrick and others on all the Conodont biostratigraphy of the Carboniferous. I, I can't even remember all of them, but there, there are 10 chapters up there that, are, that you're free to download, please. So uh, I guess that's it. If, uh, if, if you all want to turn on your screens, we can say goodbye. And thank you so much from, uh, from deep thanks to all of you for, for doing this. This has been just Bye. a wonderful experience. Yeah. Bye to everyone. Bye, Wang Chang Dong. Thanks, everyone. You'll hear from us. We'll be in touch. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Organizers, Bye. stay on. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.